Thanks to everybody for coming out. Um, this is such a beautiful setting, and I was trying to think of, of what piece to read for you all. I'm going to read two sections from uh, Emily at the Wind. And this first one is, is simply titled Beth, and obviously it's about Beth. Um, but the reason I wanted to read it here is because walking around this area, I got to walk down to the water and go down to the pier. And one of the really wonderful things was seeing the children out fishing. And you just got this sense that a parent could come here and just sort of allow their child to wander around and find their way and do some exploring. And there's not that many places around where you can do that anymore. And I think there probably used to be more in the past. And this section deals with a part of Beth's life where she would go on summer vacation with her family. She's recalling it all um, through that sort of magical prism that adults create when they're thinking about their childhood. And so this is Beth. 12 years old. She was 10 years old. She wore sundresses and went barefoot. There were shorts, loose tank tops. The lingering hint of sunscreen applied in the morning mingled with late afternoon bug repellent. A sticky film of orange popsicle residue glazed across her lips and chin. Grape popsicles, red popsicles, glasses of iced tea, milk, soda, lemonade. It was not the cosmopolitan set before her, not that nip immediately following every sip, nor the glow that trails lazily afterwards. It was not Marlboro Lights met with umber lipstick. It was not here, not him, none of this. It was summertime. Child, girl, child, 11 years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. The Adirondacks, the yearly family rental, early August heat. Do you want to go out to the log? Go down to Ollie's for Sundays. I'll play you in checkers. Let's catch it and you put it in the jar. Put spit on it. Lick it. I will teach you. The tune was the same. It is often the tune. He wasn't her father, wasn't her brother, wasn't her girlfriends or teachers or even any of the neighborhood gang. He was a fawn. Light, willowy fawn dust bleached white in the sun. Fawn dust tickling her forearms and winking up at her from beneath the hem of his soccer team shorts. Lime green tang of little boy sweat. Dirty ears. Perfectly formed, tanned, softly laughing ears. Under the porch watching sandal straps, car tires, grasshoppers, the timeless battle of lawn giving way to hot dirt. Always the fear, the awareness, the giddy ache of bugs, spiders, rodents, snakes, watching the watchers for signs of vulnerability. Everything dry and creaky. Let's rub crayons over the paper on the bark. I know how to sing that. Let's take these down to the water and throw them in. Fish, hunt, run. Crawl, jump. The paint is always forest green. It always peels and chips, unleashing the smell of dried pine needles. The wood is not pine, but the smell is pine needles. The taste is pine needles. The sound, sap drooling. The light gives natural warmth, broken. Checkerboards, family dogs, wet dog, a deflated football near a clothesline heavy with damp swimsuits. Cars are always leaving. This radioactive memory, the edges burnt away. A radiant veil of sauce drizzled over him, them, that place, that time. He has no eyebrows. The eyebrows are youthful smiles dancing over dewy mirrors of green flecked brown. His nose always ran. His nose was always running, sneezing, wiping, leaving slick narrow ridges across the hem of his yellow t-shirts. The voice warbles two octaves too high. A loose rustle of wheat whispering the secret to the clouds to keep from the sky. 
always their secrets. So throughout this book, I, uh, I, one of my goals was to be able to drop in and out of the main character's lives at different points, whether it was childhood or adulthood, and sort of flash back and forth through time, which um, looking at it in more of a poetic sense than a fiction sense allowed me access to do. Um, and uh, so I'm going to read you another section. This one is called Lucinda, which maybe you're picking up a theme with my chapter titles here. Um, and Lucinda is uh, somebody who's spending a lot of time in a place called the bar, which is a bar. And she has been giving, what else would it be, right? And this Lucinda chapter is about Lucinda. The bar is called the bar. Um, and she's been giving a rose. She's been given a rose by somebody at the bar who is not her husband. And so she's thinking about this rose, and it's the end of the night, and she has the rose, and she needs to think about what is she going to do with the rose, and also what would happen if she did come home with this rose. So this is Lucinda. A pile of fresh red roses in the dumpster. Garbage on top of them, garbage beneath. Most would not consider these fresh red roses garbage. The garbage date of roses linked closely to the browning of their leaves and petals. These are not the roses from her wedding day clustered in a dried mass on the bedroom wall. Not old prom roses. Not roses from Mrs. Shields' garden down the street. Perhaps not really roses at all. Certainly no baby's breath. Once the decision has been made to eat only sauce, cheese, toppings, and leave the rest, pizza crust becomes garbage. The pizza <laughs> Am I too loud? Am I not loud enough? This just keeps drooping. I get that. That happens to me. Oh, I overshared. The pizza box becomes garbage once the pizza has been ingested, the bottle once the drink has been drunk, the battery once its energy has been spent, and so forth. Things can be done to accelerate the process from utility to garbage. After all, one cannot live on roses. And what would Jay think? It has been months, perhaps longer, since roses were appropriate in their household. He would never buy it. Even if she felt like constructing an entire fiction with interwoven scenes and plausible plot devices based on realistic actions of characters familiar to them both, why bother? I bought them from an old blind woman on the corner of Sheffield Avenue. She was in a nylon lawn chair. They were beautiful. She looked so content. The sun was on her face. It lit up the spray of petals as if from within illuminated roses. I couldn't resist. Yes, Bob gave them to me for closing on the Goldstein property. No, nobody else could even come close. A coup, a coup. See how healthy, smell, touch, finger. Watch me arrange these vibrant roses atop the living room table for all to savor. Victory roses. My father stopped into the office as a nice surprise and took me out to lunch. The restaurant was the one, the new one, across the street from the theater on Tompkins. The Italian place. Lovely veal, warm bread. It was even nice enough to eat outdoors. Next door was the florist, and when Daddy excused himself to go to the bathroom, he returned with these, these roses, Daddy roses. A pile of fresh red roses in the dumpster. Once they fan out and fall between wads of wax paper and assorted plastic wraps, they cease to form a bouquet. Nor is a single red rose, though perhaps romantic to many, a bouquet, especially one on the concrete. What is it? Pink roses are for friendship. Black roses are for death. Red roses are for love until, of course, they brown and end up in a dumpster, at which point they are nearer to landfill than love, or even lust. Mountains of used baby diapers and other miscellaneous crap. Trash. Garbage. Of course, the process can be accelerated. The line was easier to cross than she expected when thinking about the line at various times since they were married seven years ago.